Captain Cook was advanced a few paces before the Marines when they fired. The stones flew as thick as hail, which knocked the lieutenant down, and as he was rising, a fellow struck him in the back with a spear. However, he recovered himself, shot the Indian dead, and escaped into the water. Captain Cook was now the only man on the rock. He was seen walking down towards the pinnace, holding his left hand against the back of his head to guard it from the stones and carrying his musket under the other arm. An Indian came running behind, stopping once, stopping once or twice as he advanced, as if he was afraid that he should turn around, and then, taking him unaware, he sprung at him, knocked him on the back of the head with a large club and instantly fled with the greatest precipitation. The blow made Captain Cook stagger two or three paces. He then fell on his hand and one knee and dropped his musket. And as he was rising, another Indian came running to him and before he could recover himself from the fall, drew out an iron dagger he concealed under his feathered cloak and stuck it with all his force into the back of his neck, which made Captain Cook tumble into the water. It was February 14, 1779, and a few moments later, Captain Cook was dead. <clears throat> I think just, just as uh, that um, particular um, description of the end of Captain Cook is a very dramatic ending, um, I think it, it posed a, a problem for, um, for Europe in the sense that this person, this man who had um, been so instrumental for the past 11 years in exploring the Pacific, uh, was suddenly no more. And I think that um, some of that, some of the idea of the, the shock and horror which um, um, occurred in uh, Kalakukua Bay was that the people who survived the skirmish um, actually left Cook's body and that, that of the other Marines, the four Marines who were also killed, uh, on the beach. There was just simply uh, a, a moment of um, total uh, blankness, if you like, a great shock. So what we have in the next few days is we have the two vessels, the, um, the Resolution and the Discovery, still at uh, anchor in uh, Kalakulukua Bay, and gradually there is a, um, uh, a return to some sort of normality, if that's possible. The uh, remains of Captain Cook, uh, some flesh and a few of the uh, bones were returned to um, the resolution and uh, gradually the work to the foremast and the resolution was completed as well so that the, um, the vessel could finally leave the bay, which it did about a week later. And on the 21st, seven days after the, um, the massacre, um, Cook's remains were interred in Calico Bay and given um, all due respects. The problem for people back in Europe, of course, was that without a body, uh, it was very hard to, to mourn Cook. And I think that um, is a problem which confronted historians too, trying to commemorate his name and his memory in, in some, uh, some appropriate fashion. This wonderful little uh, ditty box, which is in the um, State Library of New South Wales, is an example of how the crew of the Resolution went about trying to express their feelings. Uh, this was carved out of timber from the Resolution, and you'll see that it has a, a lock of Cook's hair in it, and also it has a little um, uh, image there, a painting of um, Kalakua Bay, the, the rocky point where Cook was killed and also with the, the various plaques there, it refers to the places where Cook was most renowned in, in his work. So his work in Quebec when he was um, a very young uh, officer, uh, doing soundings in the St Lawrence River, which allowed um, the British to take Quebec. Um, his work in Newfoundland when he really honed his skills as a surveyor. Um, and then some of the uh, other places he was. With the, the little ditty box here, it's an example of, I think, the crew um, providing something for Mrs Cook. Uh, on, the, on the sides of the box, there's an inscription which says, Made a Resolution Oak for Mrs Cook of the crew. The vessels uh, then continued north through the Hawaiian group, um, continued on under Clark um, in command at this point, and... Um, News of Cook's death uh, finally came across overland, across from uh, Russia, across to uh, London, and finally arrived in London in January in 1780. And, of course, it caused uh, great consternation. This is a, an example of um, 
one of the uh, effects that that news had, this is a, uh, a short elegy which was written by Mrs Seward, or Miss Seward at the time. And you'll get some idea of the, uh, the very um, uh, raised feelings at that time. This is from the last verse of that elegy. O oh, raise thy thoughts to yonder starry plain and own thy sorrow selfish, weak and vain, since while Britannia in his virtues just twines the bright wreath and rears the immortal bust, while on each wind of heaven his fame shall rise in endless incense to the smiling skies, the attendant power that bade his sails expand and waft her blessings to each barren land, now raptured bears him to the mortal plains where mercy hails him with congenial strains, where soars on joy's white plume his spirit free and angels choir him while he waits for thee. Now, while this might have been a very nice way to remember Cook, I hardly think that it gives us any real information and um, uh, I don't think it's a, an entirely appropriate uh, commemoration of Cook. I think at, just as people were shocked after the death of Cook in Hawaii, um, it took some time back in England um, for people to come to terms with this death. The Royal Society uh, in 1784 attempted to commemorate the death of Cook um, by producing this uh, commemorative medal in bronze, silver and in uh, gold. This particular one here is one of the silver examples. And um, one of these was donated or presented to Mrs Cook um, along with an amount of £200 and an annuity which was settled on uh, Elizabeth Cook by George III. So in the absence of Cook, there was a great uh, attempt to support Mrs Cook, the, uh, the living, uh, the survivor of um, this great man. People like Sir Hugh Palliser, who had been so instrumental in, in Cook's career, he also um, erected a monument to Cook at his own estate in Buckinghamshire, um, where he had an inscription to the memory of James Cook, the ablest navigator this or any other country hath produced. George III also, uh, in 1785, allowed a, a coat of arms, a memorial coat of arms, um, for the Cook family. So there are all these various attempts of, by people to uh, find an appropriate way of commemorating Cook. There's also, at this time, um, various people coming out with uh, lives of Cook, trying to piece together enough information. And, of course... Um, there was a very ready market. People wanted to know not only how Cook had died, which of course was very um, uh, gory, spectacular, had all the, the, the good uh, requirements of a great story, but people also then wanted to know more about this man's uh, early life. So one of the earliest examples we have of somebody trying to knit together some sort of a biography is the work put together by George Christoph Lichtenberg in 1780. Lichtenberg, the, um, the German uh, intellectual and philosopher, um, used sources from a number of places. Uh, apart from um, Johann Reinhold Forster, he also used uh, information from newspapers and also information from Lieutenant John Rickman, um, a German-speaking uh, uh, officer uh, on that resolution voyage. Now, the standard process when people came back on these voyages was that any journals they had were confiscated by the commander because really it was um, uh, these were all the property of the Admiralty and they didn't want any um, unofficial accounts coming out. In Rickman's case, he was able, because he uh, spoke uh, German, to keep his journal or his notes in German and so um, they escaped the net. In 1781, there was also an account, uh, Reisum die Welt mit Captain Cook, which was produced by Heinrich Zimmermann, uh, an able seaman, um, on the discovery. And in that case, the, uh, the Admiralty actually suppressed the publication and there was no English uh, version of that until 1926. Again, we have another account by an American, John Ledyard, who was one of the Marine corporals on the resolution who produced an account in 1783. But really, there was no official account of... Um, anything to do commemorating Cook's life until the official account of the third voyage was finally published in 1784. Uh, that was the account 
uh, edited by the Reverend John Douglas, the Canon of Windsor, where he brought together the account of um, Cook's journal up to the time of his death in 1779, and then, then uh, added to it the account of um, King, who had uh, brought the discovery back to England. Now, there'd also been all sorts of problems with the engravings, all of the, um, the various of accounts of Cook, the Hawksworth's version, Douglas's uh, second account, and finally the third account, were always very rich in engravings. And one of the problems with Cook's death was that um, there was a lot of information out there, but there was a need to consolidate charts, uh, the work of the various artists, along with um, the appropriate journals uh, to create the official account. And this all took time. So it was in 1784, four years, four and a bit years after Cook's death, that um, this uh, account finally comes out. And it's that really which uh, sparks George Forster to describe the introduction to that third voyage, the introduction written by uh, John Douglas, as being intolerable. And what I want to look at now is, is some of the reasons as to um, why he might have regarded that as being intolerable. This um, portrait of Captain Cook by Nathaniel Dance was done after the second voyage. And the second voyage is the one on which both Reinald Forster and George Forster uh, sailed with Cook. And you can see that uh, Cook has his hand on a chart here. Um, we'll see the chart in a moment. But in many, many ways, um, I believe the second voyage was the most arduous, uh, a voyage which took uh, the resolution and the adventure down into Antarctic waters, the resolution um, down into areas as far as uh, 71 degrees south, um, dodging uh, icebergs, incredibly cold conditions, conditions where the, the crew, the only protection they had were Fearnaught jackets, uh, very heavy felt jackets. Um, and I think if any, any, uh, anybody was going to see Cook in his true light, this was, a, this was a time when Cook was really at the height of his powers in what I think was the most arduous of all his voyages. And so it's interesting that George Forster um, should at a later time decide to uh, write about this voyage. So some of the reasons why Forster might think that um, Douglas's account was intolerable. Well, of course, at the end of the adventure, uh, the Endeavour voyage, the uh, Cook had returned to England, um, but it had been really much, very much a triumph for Sir Joseph Banks. It was Sir Joseph Banks who was lionised in the press. And although Cook was um, promoted to commander and he very quickly went about um, being involved in the planning for the second voyage... Um, it, as I say, it was, it was very much Banks's, Banks's show. And so when planning had progressed to a certain point with the second voyage, Lord Sandwich, who at that time was the um, uh, first lord, first sea lord in charge of the Admiralty, invited Banks uh, to come back and to go on the second voyage with Cook. And Banks, of course, uh, could hardly say no. He would be expected by the public, the anticipation of uh, yet another great adventure that he should be involved in. Well, Banks took to the planning with great gusto to a point where he uh, took uh, over, to a large extent, control of um, changes to the accommodation on the resolution. The resolution, of course, had been chosen by Cook. Again, it was a collier, a larger collier than the Endeavour initially. But um, Banks, of course, had been unhappy throughout the first voyage. He'd felt that the accommodation in, uh, for, in the great cabin um, was very small, very tight, and if he was going to go on to another voyage, particularly into such um, difficult conditions down in the Antarctic, he certainly wanted to have um, far better arrangements, particularly as he planned to have a group of 17 people, 17 supernumeraries. Um, not only he and Solander, but also um, uh, Dr James Lind, who was to act as a naturalist, um, various draftsmen, um, but also a horn player, uh, just uh, to keep him entertained. So we have this period in 1772 from about November through to April where the resolution is in Deptford in the dockyard 
undergoing very large renovations. And the plans which are now in the um, National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, the plans they have show the vessel in the state um, showing these changes. Um, and what you see is that the vessel is simply getting taller and taller. The superstructure is being built up higher and higher. And whereas you might um, expect initially to have had a quarter deck, now there's a, another layer, a roundhouse, which for all that name is actually a square cabin stuck on top of the quarter deck. Now what this um, does is it, it from an um, um, engineering point of view, it actually raises the centre of balance. And so when the vessel finally was uh, ready to go down the Thames to undergo sea trials, it was found to be entirely top-heavy. It was crank, as they say. It wouldn't sail um, worth a farthing. And throughout this process, Cook had been um, very much aware of what was going on. Um, the Navy board, who was um, in charge of these uh, changes, had kept up a conversation, a dialogue with the Admiralty, saying these are uh, dangerous things to be doing to this vessel. But it wasn't until the proof was in the pudding that the vessel tried to sail down, down the uh, Thames and down to the Downs that um, the vessel was shown to be so top-heavy that uh, it was um, totally um, dangerous. It, it uh, was not going to be able to go um, anywhere very far and certainly not down into the Southern Ocean. So in May, thing came, things came to a head. The vessel at that stage uh, was back in harbour and an ultimatum was, was put. Cook said, this vessel is um, unseaworthy. Banks said, well, this is the way I want it. And at that time, the, both the Admiralty and the Navy Board supported Cook. Banks pulls out. He says, well, if it's not going to be that way, well, I'm not, simply not going on this expedition. And at that point, we have an opportunity for Johann Reinhold Forster and his son to enter the fray. Descended from a Yorkshireman, who had emigrated to Danzig in the middle of the 17th century, Johann Reinhold Forster was born just outside that city in 1729. He showed an early gift for languages, which he studied formally, along with classical and biblical studies, at school in Berlin, before attending the Friedrichs University of Hull, where he enrolled in theological studies, but showed a greater interest in natural history. In 1753, he was ordained and sent to the parish of Nassenhuben, where he remained as pastor and developed scholarly interests in geography and ancient civilizations over the following 12 years. He married in 1754, and his son George, the first of eight children, was born later in the same year. Forster corresponded widely, and his skill, of, his skill for languages brought him to the attention of influential people at the court of Catherine the Great in 1765. In that year, he travelled with George to St Petersburg, where he received a commission to investigate and report on the fledgling settlements of German immigrants Catherine was attempting to establish along the Volga. The commission went badly. Forster was thorough in his work, and instead of producing a report which would encourage more Germans to migrate, as expected by the Russian authorities, his report was a starkly honest appraisal which alienated his Russian employer. When his demands for payment were refused, he and his son left for England, where they arrived in October 1766 with little money but great resolve to succeed in a nation which had, rule, had been ruled by Hanoverian monarchs since 1714. In London, Johann Reinhold drew on German connections in an attempt to gain a scholarly appointment and became a regular attendant at the Society of Antiquaries and an elected fellow in early 1767. Shortly after, he was appointed tutor of modern languages and natural history at Warrington Academy, where, despite the rigorous demands of his teaching duties, he found time to further develop his interest in natural history. Forster remained at Warrington for three years, but became increasingly involved in translating European scientific writers, a stimulating use of his linguistic skills, which brought him growing prominence in intellectual circles. In 1770, he moved to London, and over the next two years, a number of his translations, including Bougainville's Voyage Around the World, appeared in print. He was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in early 1772. Thus, Johann Reinhold Forster, thus Johann Reinhold Forster's erudite interests and reputation as a naturalist were prominent just when, with Banks and Solander no longer prepared to sail on the resolution, the Admiralty required a suitable replacement. In 
Forster's name was put forward and Sandwich accepted. Johann Reinhold Forster, accompanied by his 18-year-old son, George, was to join Cook's second voyage. <clears throat> so this is the, um, the chart which was produced after the second voyage. And uh, really this, sent, this chart makes a lot more sense when you look at um, charts which existed before that time where people postulated the existence of a great south land, the Terra Australis Incognita. With this chart, you can see um, that great um, speculative continent in the south has disappeared, and what we see is the, uh, the true shape there of southern Australia, southern America, and uh, South Africa. In uh, joining the voyage, Reinhold Forster... Uh, was given £4,000 to act as naturalist. Now, this money had been um, earmarked for James Lynn, the naturalist, and had been voted by Parliament. And um, it was really quite a large amount of money and was to uh, create quite uh, some jealousies amongst other people, such as William Wales, who was the astronomer on board the vessel. <clears throat> As I say, the, the voyage was very much a voyage in uh, difficult conditions and one of the, uh, the, um, the great things that George Forster did afterwards is to produce uh, an essay which um, he called Cook der Entdecker, Cook the Discoverer um, and we'll get on to that in a moment but this is a, an excerpt from that essay where he gives you some idea of the conditions. And this is all, I think, um, proving that he was a person who did have the qualifications. Not only had he sailed with Cook, but he'd observed Cook in these very difficult conditions, and he was a good writer. So this is Forster writing about the icebergs. Often a storm would rage, even during dark fogs. Often we did not see the sun for a fortnight or three weeks encircled by vast masses of ice which emerged from the sea like floating islands and were more dangerous because their positions would change. We often sighted them when it was almost too late to steer the ships past. How many times may we have, without even knowing it, barely escaped destruction in the dark? How often did we hear with terror the waves breaking over the ice without being able to lay our eyes on the object of our fear? We spent summer in, these icy, in this icy part of the world, but it was a summer when it was unusual to record th the thermometer registering one degree above freezing. So I think that in the case of um, the Forsters, they had proven through going on this voyage, observing Cook, that they were very much um, uh, capable of writing with authority uh, about Cook. And the opportunity for Forster to write a, a commemorative piece came uh, in 1786 when um, there was a, uh, the opportunity to translate the official account, the official English account of the third voyage, Cook's third voyage, into German. And we have Forster now, he, by this stage, he'd come back from the resolution voyage uh, to a very unhappy, unhappy welcome. Whereas John Hawkesworth had made a great deal of money out of uh, editing and publishing the first voyage account. When the uh, resolution and the adventure came back um, in 1775, the understanding was, or understanding as far as Johann Reinhold Forster was, that he would be given the same privilege, that it would be his job to, um, to produce the voyage account. Well, things had changed in the interim. Cook had read, his, had seen the first, um, he'd got his eyes onto the uh, Hawksworth account for the first time at the Cape of Good Hope, and he was horrified, quite frankly, by what he read. Hawksworth had uh, attributed many things to Cook, which Cook um, didn't agree with, and um, w we get the feeling that uh, Cook had, as the um, second voyage had progressed, he'd begun to think more about how he wanted to be perceived. Did he really want his words to be Put, it, put out by somebody else or did he want to have a, a much greater say in it? So when the vessels come back um, we find there is uh, 
a bit of tension uh, occurring. And um, Cook basically wants to have a much greater say in that second voyage account. Um, initially, Reinald Forster is, is happy to go along with this, but um, gradually um, things start falling apart. And it gets to a point by 1776 when Lord Sandwich calls, calls the party, parties together. He brings them to an official meeting um, where he tries to iron out the problems. And at that meeting, there's an agreement, a signed legal agreement made whereby uh, it's agreed that Cook will um, create a journal which looks at uh, the voyage account. He'll also look at um, some of the ethno ethnographic issues of uh, the voyage. And Reinald Forster will produce a quite separate account, his observations, which will look at um, the scientific observations of the account. And th this seems to be a, a line in the sand. Everybody understands where they, uh, where they stand at this point. The only problem occurs when Reinald Forster submits his first draft to Sandwich to read. Um, Sandwich throws it back at him and says, well, you've written an enormous amount about Madeira here. This is something that everybody else and his dog has written about. Uh, this is simply not good enough. We're going to put this to a, um, an editor. And of course, Reinald Forster, uh, a person of um, huge intellectual ability in, in his own right, uh, took great um, um, affront at this and refused. So we have this uh, basically this falling apart and uh, it gets worse the following year when, um, as an attempt to um, recover something from this, Reinald Forster has signed the legal agreement that he can't create a voyage account, but there's nothing to say that George Forster can't. And so George Forster spends nine months um, writing what ultimately becomes a voyage around the world in his Britannic Majesty's vessel uh, resolution in the years 1772, 3, 4 and 5. An account which draws heavily, we know, on Reinhold Forster's uh, own journal. The idea is that this will um, be produced and come onto the market before Cook's own account, that the uh, Forsters will be able to recover some of their finances and um, that their uh, part in all of this uh, wonderful voyage will be fully acknowledged. Well, unfortunately, um, it doesn't work out that way. Reinald Forster's account, when it comes out, only has two engravings in it, whereas um, Cook's account, when it comes out six weeks later, has 46 engravings. And the Admiralty makes sure that they um, um, price the Cook account so that it can com compete um, absolutely, and it does. The, um, both accounts come out at two pounds, or two guineas, and uh, the uh, Cook account is a bestseller. It sells out in a very short time at all, uh, indeed, to the point where the, um, the bookseller who um, is marketing this, uh, uh, he writes that it's a great pity that it wasn't sold for its proper price, because, of course, he would have made a great deal of money out of it. There's a great deal of acrimony which um, follows this, and George Forster um, ultimately gets into a battle with William Wales, William Wales accuses his father of being the, uh, the real voice behind the voyage, which I think to some extent is true, and um, accuses Forster of uh, intellectual piracy, all sorts of things. So there are various public debates, public um, printed papers that go back. Um, William Wales's remarks on uh, Forster's account. Then we have a reply to William Wales' um, uh, remarks on Forster's. And finally... We have an open letter, which is the, the, um, the final piece in this, where George Forster writes to Lord Sandwich openly, um, saying, uh, just pointing out all of the ways in which uh, he and his father's work has been undermined by the, the way this second voyage account has been produced. So very much you can see that there's a fair bit of ammunition here uh, why, Cook, why Forster should not particularly like uh, Sandwich, why he might have a, a grudge against Douglas, who ultimately became the um, editor of Cook's second voyage account, and certainly had a problem with Sandwich. So, in 1776, um, Forster has the opportunity to, to translate the third voyage account um, into German, and he takes that opportunity in his introduction to try and right some of these wrongs. And that is when he writes that he found um, John Douglas's introduction intolerable. 
Well, some of the things he found intolerable in that account were that um, Douglas really draws very heavily on people like William Wales. There are great slabs of Wales' comments um, reproduced, uh, whereas there are absolutely no references or one reference in a footnote to the work of the, the forces. And um, Douglas is also, in his account, he, um, he very much, very much um, is careful to provide a proper tenor. So he talks about the various voyages which had preceded Cook's, the voyages by um, Byron and Wallace and Carteret, and also talks about the great stimulation of George III to all of these voyages of discovery. So it's a very corporate um, view, if you like, which comes out in this introduction. And although Cook is held up as being a person who um, s removed any speculation about what continents might exist in the southern, uh, southern uh, ocean, um, it's a fairly, fairly ordinary uh, commemorative piece to Cook. And so George Forster, in his introduction, goes about in a very different way. Forster is very much trying to create a um, commemorative piece for, for um, Captain Cook. It's got very little to do with George III, and um, we have this wonderful essay, Cook de Entdecker. <clears throat> Yeah. Okay. So I'll just read a couple of pieces. Um, one of the wonderful things I think about the Cook de Entecker piece is that um, the final, the biography, the official biography of Cook came out in 1788, and this essay on Cook precedes it by 12 months. And the official account when it came out, produced by Andrew Kippis, was again a very corporate affair. Um, again, it draws on huge slabs. Uh, from other sources, large pieces of Hawkesworth, uh, large pieces of um, the uh, Second Voyage account, and ultimately it's a very unsatisfying affair. But it ultimately became um, the stereotype, the stereotype which existed right through until um, J.C. Beaglehold, Beaglehold's uh, Life of Cook appeared in the, in the 1970s. And unfortunately, Cook de Entdecker for many years has remained in German. Michael Hoare... Um, wrote an essay on it in 1969 and uh, one of the projects that I've been involved with recently with Horden House is we have done a translation of this and that will be appearing um, as um, the sixth in the Australian Maritime series to be published shortly before Christmas. The thing which I think gives Forster's image of Cook great validity is um, his lyrical writing and what we see is a Cook, uh, an off-duty Cook if you like, um, a cook with some of the warts. So here we have uh, an example of some of this writing. The anchor was cast at the predetermined spot. The sails were furled and the boats once again manned to try and find out what the land would yield. The first object of inquiry from the natives was a convenient spot where the empty water casks could be filled with fresh drinking water. A pantomime was necessary at such times until one had learnt the most important words of the vernacular. On the beach itself, now I have to say every time I read this I, I think of Greg, on the beach itself where the natives would gather in great numbers, one was often occupied for days learning the language, observing people who are so different from ourselves and with bartering for their clothing, weapons, ornaments and other artefacts. We studied their way of life by repeated visits to their huts and with gifts and small signs of affection we gradually gained the rights of friendship to an ever greater degree and could study the interior of the houses, their implements and their food and its preparation. Sometimes we learned very little, but every day we learned something new. We began to observe how work was assigned, clothes were made, fields were tilled and huts or canoes built. At other moments we had the opportunity to witness some remarkable custom or interesting, cu or interesting custom. At other times one unexpectedly found a fellow who was able to talk about the genesis of his gods and about creation. In each country, minerals had to be collected and the native birds, insects and reptiles had to be patiently stalked. The flowers of trees and plants would not keep and so the botanists were forced to hurry back on board to complete their descriptions and illustrations before returning to the shore. So 
I think in terms of the collection we have um, out on display today, what George Forster in Cook de Entdecker adds to that is um, these wonderful cameo images of what was going on at the time that these um, artefacts are being collected. And in terms, as I say, of the, uh, the total image that we have of Cook, I think that um, J.C. Biggelhole did as much as he could, but of course Biggelhole always rude the fact that um, one of the great sources who would have had information, Elizabeth Cook, who outlived Captain Cook by 57 years, uh, in the later years of her life, very carefully destroyed any of the personal papers, uh, the letters which um, had gone between her husband and herself. So what we are left with really, um, Beagle Hall, Hall did all the uh, legwork, um, created huge documentary invoices of um, uh, uh, inventories of where the material was, but uh, finally we're, we're left still to some extent with a two-dimensional cook. I think George Forster's account helps us greatly to... Uh, to, to soften that a little. And I know I'm going over time, so I'll just flick through the last of these images. These are some of the images. Um, this bit one particularly from that second voyage, Possession Bay down in uh, South Georgia. The wonderful image of Cook by Hodges. Of course, Hodges was one who had sailed with Cook on that second voyage again. And um, I think that personal information, personal knowledge of Cook really comes out in that image. Of course, we've had a need to remember Cook ever after, and this is a typical uh, mid-19th century um, uh, Staffordshire figure of Cook, frozen in time. And we also have this uh, you know, continuing image of Cook going to, a, going to live with the gods, something that, that people felt comfortable with rather than the reality of his real death in Hawaii. And, of course, in Hawaii, they take a far a more liberal view of Cook these days. Thank you. The National Museum of Australia in Canberra explores what it means to be Australian through our permanent galleries, exhibitions, public programs and the National Historical Collection. Find out more about the museum at nma.gov.au or download more audio programs from nma.gov.au slash audio.